town of Boroughville is in three parts. In part one, I will explain how the evidence will show that this proposed 1,000 megawatt gas fired plant is not needed. In part two, I will explain how the evidence will show that this proposed plant would cause unacceptable harm to the environment. And in part three, I will summarize some of the thoughtful, informed, and even passionate public input that has been presented this, to this board in opposition to this proposed plan. Part one, the Clear River Energy Center is not needed. Let's look at the legal standard. The legal standard is need forecasts. RIGL 42-98-11B and this board's rule 1.13C prohibit the issuance of a license for the Clear River Energy Center unless this board specifically finds that, quote, construction of the proposed facility is necessary to meet the needs of the state and or region, end quote. Also, RIGL 42-98-2 parens 2 mandates that, quote, construction, operation, and or alteration of major energy facilities shall only be undertaken when those actions are justified by long-term state and or regional need forecasts, end quote. Current need forecasts are declining. Current need forecasts from the independent system operator, ISO, show declining net demand over the next 10 years. As a result, no new large fossil fuel generating facilities have received a capacity supply obligation in the last two forward capacity auctions. There is no credible evidence that a new 1,000 megawatt gas-fired generating facility is needed in this region at this time or for the foreseeable future. The outdated need forecast relied upon by the PUC in 2000, this 2016 advisory opinion is simply no longer current, correct, or even relevant to this document. Let's look at the ISO 2018 need forecast. The ISO forecast of net peak summer load is important because it is used by ISO to set the annual net installed capacity requirement, which in turn can tell us whether new power plants are needed in New England. A recent ISO forecast from 2018 estimates that the net peak summer load in New England will decline from 26,064 megawatts, that's 26,064 megawatts this year in 2018, to 25,025447 megawatts in 2026. Forecasted net demand is therefore decreasing, not increasing, in New England. As Mr. Glenn Walker, the town's energy market expert, testifies in his supplemental testimony, quote, the passage of time has eliminated the need for either of the CREC units. Omissions. The demand for electricity continues to decline in the region, as evidenced by ISO NE's 2018 draft forecast of future net summer peak loads, which, under very conservative assumptions, is at least 500 megawatts lower than the ISO NE 2017 capacity energy, loads, and transmission report, end quote. Capacity needs are represented by ISO's annual calculation of net installed capacity requirement. And this figure has been declining, as Mr. Elmer showed, for each of the last forward capacity auctions. What is causing this reduction in the ISO energy need forecasts? Mr. Walker explains that this is, quote, a result of new renewable and demand resources, quote, and, quote, a continued surplus of capacity, quote. In light of the fact that the determination of whether this plant is needed must, by Rhode Island law, be, quote, justified by long-term state and or regional energy need forecasts, quote, the current ISO NE forecast of steadily decreasing need should end the inquiry the proposed plan should be rejected by this board simply because it is not needed under the ISO need forecast. Let's look at recent auctions. The ISO in those auctions has been consistently procuring significant surplus capacity. In FCA 10, 
conducted over two years ago in early 2016, ISO procured a surplus of 1,416 megawatts of capacity. Then, in FCA 11, in early 2017, ISO procured another surplus of 1,926 megawatts of capacity. Then, in FCA 12, held in February of this year, ISO procured a surplus again of 1,103 megawatts of capacity. In addition, a number of bidders were qualified to offer even more capacity than ISO eventually procured. These surpluses demonstrate that neither Unit 1 nor Unit 2 of the Clear River Energy Center are needed in our zone. Energy efficiency and demand response are reducing need. 3,600 megawatts of energy efficiency and demand response measures cleared FCA 12, including 514 new megawatts. These 514 new megawatts are the equivalent of an entire new power plant. Energy efficiency and demand response measures are therefore taking the place of new fossil fuel-fired plants in New England. This is really good news. Let's look at the ISO declining price trend, again, that Mr. Elmer talked about. This is clearly associated with surplus capacity. On February 8th of this year, ISO conducted forward capacity auction 12. As shown in the ISO press release from that auction, colon, quote, this is the ISO speaking, the clearing price was the lowest in five years due to a surplus of capacity in the region, end quote. The auction had a clearing price of $4.63 per kilowatt month. This low capacity price is evidence of the steady, continuing decline in the need for capacity in our zone. Let's look at the numbers. Mr. Elmer had them on the board. The clearing price for units in our zone in FCA 9 from 2015 was $17.73. In FCA 10 in 2016, it dropped to $7.03. In FCA 11, the price declined to $5.30. And now, in FCA 12, 2018, the price has declined again to $4.63 per kilowatt month. This dramatic decline in capacity prices shows that there is a significant surplus of capacity system-wide, and it illustrates the lack of need for new fossil fuel generating plants. Let's look at something that's a mouthful to say. It's the dynamic DLID bid threshold. It's known as the DDBT. The dynamic DLIST list bid threshold is dropping due to surplus capacity. This threshold comes into play when an existing plant wants to retire. The price is reviewed every three years. On January 8th of this year, ISO made a filing with the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. In that filing, ISO asked to reduce the dynamic delist bid threshold because of the significant capacity in our zone. FERC recently approved this filing. So the dynamic delist bid threshold will be reduced from $5.50 to $4.30 starting with FCA 13 in 2019. The ISO explained the need for the reduction in its FERC filing as follows, quote, The decrease in the DDBT is warranted by the changes in supply and demand dynamics since the last time the DDBT was set. Data from FCA 9 used when the internal market monitor last set the DDBT for FCA 10 reflected a projected capacity shortage of over 1,600 megawatts. Since that time, existing capacity has increased each year while the installed capacity requirement has consistently decreased." End quote. Now let me repeat that one more time. This is the ISO talking to FERC. Since that time, existing capacity has increased each year while the installed capacity requirement has consistently decreased. Note that FCA 10, which is when there was a projected shortage, was when Invenergy received its CSO for Unit 1. Moreover, ISO was very clear in its FERC filing when it unequivocally stated, quote, there is no indication that the current trend 
of increasing surpluses will reverse in the near future. End quote. Let's look at the disqualification of Unit 2 from FCA 12 and Unit 2's failure to be picked up in either FCA 10 or FCA 11. We believe this shows that the correct facility is not needed. As we all know, Unit 2 failed to obtain a capacity supply obligation in both FCA 10 and 11, and that it was then disqualified from even bidding into FCA 12. This is further proof that in the language of RIGL 42-98-11B, the Clear River Energy Center is not, quote, necessary to meet the needs of the state and or the region, quote. Clearly, the market has changed since FCA 10 in 2016. <coughs> Mr. Walker explains that although Unit 1 did receive a capacity supply obligation for 485 megawatts in early 2016 in FCA 10, the passage of time since the order of that capacity supply obligation, quote, has eliminated the need for either of the correct units, end quote. Mr. Walker explains that the electricity market in New England has quickly been adding renewable resources and alternative energy supplies, including solar, wind, hydropower, and electric storage. <coughs> Moreover, while renewable and alternative energy resources are rapidly increasing, the overall net demand for electricity in our region continues to steadily decrease. As a result, as Mr. Walker testified, quote, neither of the correct units are needed in the region, end quote. With regard to the outdated 2016 PUC Single Commissioner Advisory Opinion regarding need, signed by former PUC Commissioner DeSimone, Mr. Walker testifies that the PUC Advisory Opinion is currently, quote, invalid because of information that was not known or knowable at the time, end quote. For example, since the time that opinion was issued, numerous changes have occurred, including, one, Unit 2 was disqualified from FCA 12. <coughs> Two, forward capacity prices have steadily dropped due to surplus capacity. Three, substantial capacity surpluses were acquired by FCA, by uh, ISO in both FCA 11 and FCA 12. Four, rapid increases of state-sponsored renewable resources have occurred, including 400 megawatts of new renewables proposed in Rhode Island by Governor Raimondo. Five, the ISO need forecast shows steady declines in the net peak summer low. And remember, the statute requires you to look to need forecasts to determine whether or not the facility before you is needed. Six, the capacity supply obligation for Unit 1 has turned out to be $13.9 million per year, more expensive than capacity procured in FCA 12 due to capacity surpluses and fallen capacity prices. And seven, although former Commissioner DeSimone identified 6,000 megawatts as being, quote, at risk, quote, in our region, no large-scale resources at all retired after he wrote his opinion in FCA 11, and only 511 megawatts retired in FCA 12. In other words, <coughs> the significant retirements that Commissioner DeSimone was concerned about have simply not occurred. These changes could not have been foreseen by PUC Commissioner DeSimone when he issued his advisory opinion in 2016. Let's look a little bit more at the rapid growth of alternatives. Mr. Walker points out that in FCA 11, ISO procured 269 megawatts more energy efficiency and demand reduction than it did in FCA 10. This was an increase of approximately 72% from 10 to 11 one year. In addition, in FCA 11, there were 330 megawatts more of behind-the-meter solar resources than there were in FCA 10. This is an increase of approximately 84% in that single year. This single year shows how dramatically and how quickly non-fossil fuel resources have recently penetrated into our market. In 2016, Connecticut, Massachusetts, and Rhode Island procured 460 megawatts of clean energy from large-scale wind and solar resources. In addition, Massachusetts is also one promoting solar through its Solar Massachusetts Renewable Target Program, the SMART program, 
that is anticipated to add an additional 1,600 megawatts of solar and energy storage projects to the New England system. Two, Massachusetts is negotiating for 1,200 megawatts of baseload renewables. And three, Massachusetts is evaluating bids submitted by offshore wind developers for up to 800 megawatts. Massachusetts, of course, is in our zone, so all of these look to our need requirements in our zone. And as I previously stated, Governor Raimondo announced plans for 400 megawatts of renewable energy, such as solar and offshore wind. Let's look at Mr. Hardy's predictions of, of need. Mr. Hardy's predictions have simply been wrong. Of course, Invenergy's expert witness predicts that the plant will be needed. Unfortunately, however, unfortunately for Invenergy, Mr. Hardy's predictions have been consistently wrong. Crex Unit 2 was not picked up by ISO in 2016, it was not picked up in 2017, and it was disqualified in 2018. Mr. Hardy's testimony predicted unequivocally that it would be picked up in 2017, it was not. He was wrong again when he predicted that it would be picked up in 2018. It was not because they were disqualified. Undaunted by those veiled predictions, and ignoring the current ISL forecast of declining need over the next 10 years, Mr. Hardy again predicts that Unit 2 will be picked up in FCA 13, which will take place in February of 2019. In fact, this prediction by Mr. Hardy is essentially the entire foundation of Invenergy's case regarding whether this facility is needed. I think you can see that Mr. Hardy is highly likely to be just as wrong in his 2019 prediction as he was in his failed 2017 and 2018 predictions. He has no credibility left in this regard. Why has Mr. Hardy been so consistently wrong? According to the testimony of Mr. Walker, one major reason is that Mr. Hardy has failed to properly account for the additions of these large-scale renewable resources that I've discussed, including behind-the-meter solar and energy efficiency. In fact, Connecticut recently determined that a proposed new fossil-fired plant at the Killingly Energy Center was not necessary for the reliability of the electric power system in our region. The Siting Council in Connecticut therefore ruled that the plant was not needed and rejected it, just as we hope this board will reject the Clear River Energy Center based on the lack of need. The Unit 1 capacity supply obligation that Invenergy does have can be satisfied by other providers in this zone. It's important to emphasize that the Unit 1 485 megawatt capacity supply obligation does not mean, does not mean, that ISO believes that those 485 megawatts need to be produced in the town of Boroughville by Invenergy's proposed plant. That's not what that capacity supply obligation means. This power could be produced anywhere in our zone by any qualified provider. And this is demonstrated by the fact that Invenergy has already sold its capacity supply obligation for 2019 to 20 to another provider in our zone and that ISO approved that sale. In other words, we now know that another existing provider in our zone stands ready, willing, and able to provide the 485 megawatts in the future. The Clear River Energy Center is also unlikely to support renewables. Invenergy's claim that the Clear River Energy Center will help support renewable development is substantially overstated. The Clear River Energy Center facility is unlikely to be available to backstop the needs of renewables when the sun is not shining and the wind is not blowing. Why? Because if the Clear River Energy Center were built, it would be running nearly all the time, producing base load power. Therefore, when the sun stops shining and the wind stops blowing, the ISO will not, in most cases, be able to ask the Clear River Energy Center to power up to su supplement any renewable deficiencies because the Clear River Energy Center will already be running as baseline. New projects are getting ready to come online in our zone. As Mr. Elmer pointed out, new projects in our zone are being developed as we, as we speak. A 485 megawatt project known as Bridgeport Harbor 6 was approved in 2016 by the Connecticut Siting Council. 
a 350 megawatt project in Massachusetts known as Canal 3 was approved in 2017 by the Massachusetts EFSB. Both will be coming online soon. Both will have fast start, ramping, and flexibility characteristics. Clear River Energy Center's new proposed new units simply do not need to be added to the mix because demand is decreasing, not increasing. No forecast of need for the Clear River Energy Center 1000 megawatt plan has been provided under a state master construction plan. I'd like to bring your attention to RIGL 42-98-8A4. That requires that an applicant for a proposed major energy facility must provide, quote, all studies and forecasts complete with the information, data, methodology, and assumptions on which they are based, on which the applicant intends to rely, showing the need for the proposed facility under the statewide master construction plan submitted annually. In addition, Rule 1.35 of this board requires that, quote, each entity intending to construct a major energy facility in the state must file annually with the board a statewide master construction plan consisting of a brief and concise description of any major energy facilities which the filing party proposes to construct in the succeeding two years, end quote. This plan must be updated on each subsequent December 1st. The plain fact is that Invenergy has never filed with this board an original or an updated statewide master construction plan. Invenergy has therefore not met the statutory requirement that it must submit, quote, forecasts which demonstrate the need for the proposed facility under the statewide master construction plan, end quote. Finally, in the needs section, any projected savings have been reduced to near zero and are far outweighed by the environmental harm the Clear River Energy Center will cause. As shown by the testimony of Mr. Walker, and as shown by the dramatic decline of capacity prices from about $17 to under $5, this means that CREC would now produce little, if any, savings to Rhode Island ratepayers. Although Mr. Parker testified before the Public Utilities Commission, that there would be what he identified as, quote, small but meaningful savings, quote, in the range of 1 to 2 percent. His calculations were done in 2016. This was done prior to the lower capacity price results of FCA 12 and FCA 11. Moreover, a 1 percent to 2 percent savings would be greatly outweighed by the unacceptable harm this proposed facility would do to our environment as I will now address in part two. The Clear River Energy Center will cause unacceptable harm to the environment. Let's look at the legal standard. RIGL 42-98-11B and EFSB Rule 1.13C prohibit this board from issuing a license for the Clear River Energy Center unless this board specifically finds that, quote, the proposed facility will not cause unacceptable harm to the environment. RIGL 42-98-2 paren C also requires that, quote, the facility shall produce the fewest possible adverse effects on the quality of the state's environment, most particularly its land and its wildlife and resources, the health and safety of its citizens, the purity of its air and water, its aquatic and marine life, and its aesthetic and recreational value to the public." End quote. In the Ocean State Power decision of this board, dated October 25, 1988, this board stated, quote, State policy requires that a major energy facility produce the fewest possible adverse effects on the quality of the state's environment, and the board must implement that policy in its final decision. Thus, we conclude that the board has both the responsibility and power to evaluate all individual and cumulative impacts of the proposed facility before arriving at a final decision." End quote. In light of these legal requirements, let's look at the evidence regarding harm to the environment. Let's first look at air pollution. A former president of the United States once said, today, about 40% of Americans' carbon pollution 
comes from our power plants. There are no federal limits to the amount those plants can pump into the air. None. We limit the amount of toxic chemicals like mercury and sulfur and arsenic in our air and water. But power plants can dump as much carbon pollution into our atmosphere as they want. It's not smart. It's not right. It's not safe. End quote. Huge amounts of new air pollution would be produced in Rhode Island by the Clear River Energy Center. Mm -hmm. Right now, the proposed site that you've seen on Mr. Elmer's drawing is forested, and it is producing beneficial <coughs> oxygen, and it is absorbing harmful carbon dioxide. However, if the 1,000 megawatt Clear River Energy Center were built, here are the predicted impacts according to the Clear River Energy Center's own submittals. In terms of carbon dioxide alone, which is the primary global warming pollutant, the Clear River Energy Center would emit over 7.2 billion, that's billion with a B, pounds per year of carbon dioxide into the air above Oregon. Over 40 years of operation, the impact would be 288 billion pounds of carbon dioxide into Rhode Island's air. To get a sense of how much is a billion, and I had to do it myself to, to really understand it, one billion seconds would take 30 years to go by. 288 billion seconds would take over 8,600 years to go by. This plant would also emit many noxious pollutants, including 546,000 pounds per year of nitrogen oxides, 446,000 pounds per year of carbon monoxide, 156,000 pounds per year of volatile organic compounds, 310,000 pounds per year of particulate matter, and 104,000 pounds per year of sulfur dioxide. This is Clear River Energy Center's own calculation. Nitrogen oxides and volatile organic compounds are the chemical compounds of ground level ozone that we also know as smog. Ground level ozone is a pollutant that Rhode Island already struggles with for non-attainment of the Environmental Protection Agency ambient air quality standards. Other toxic emissions from the plant would include lead, arsenic, benzene, beryllium, cadmium, chromium, cobalt, ethylbenzene, formaldehyde, hexane, manganese, mercury, naphthalene, nickel, propylene, uh, propylene oxide, selenium, toluene, and xylenes, the list goes on and on. All of these toxic pollutants are federally listed hazardous air pollutants according to the Clean Air Act. The town's expert air pollution witness, Eric Eppner, explains the adverse health and environmental effects of each of these pollutants in his testimony. He has a chart at the back that identifies each pollutant, the amount of pounds per year that will be given off by the plant of each pollutant, and the health effects of each of these pollutants. Many of the pollutants identified by Mr. Ebner in his testimony are known to cause cancer and other serious health problems, including obviously severe respiratory impacts. Now, Invenergy claims that because the com computer modeled air emissions from the facility are below federal air quality maximums, that amount of pollution is acceptable. We believe that's incorrect. By law, the responsibility of determining what is acceptable or unacceptable <coughs> environmental impact rests solely on the shoulders of this board, not on the EPA and not on DEM. Mr. Ebner explains in his testimony why Invenergy's assumptions behind their air model do not mean that negative health and environmental effects will not occur. Hundreds of thousands of pounds of toxic air pollutions will be, pollutants will be annually emitted from this facility and people in Rhode Island will be breathing that air, even if CREC operates within the air quality maximums. The pollution in the air above the town of Barville will increase cancer risks and will have adverse rep respiratory health effects on people. Is that acceptable to this board? There will also be significant noxious emissions from construction vehicles and other trucks that will be servicing the facility if and when it were to begin operation. Large diesel trucks will be transporting materials, water, oil, ammonia, hydrogen, 
wastes, and other products to and from the facility constantly. Not only will these trucks increase hazardous and fine particulate air emissions close to the ground to the detriment of the pe people and wildlife in the immediate vicinity, but the additional traffic on Borogol's small rural roads, especially during the construction period, will cause environmental harm and will also increase the risk of serious accidents. Mr. Ebner has explained that there is not enough information available for Invenergy to prove its claim that regional air emissions throughout New England may be reduced by 1 to 2 percent. But even if Invenergy could prove that claim, a 1 to 2 percent reduction spread out over the entire New England region is greatly outweighed by the huge increase in pollutants that will occur directly in the air over the town of Barville and in the state of Rhode Island. The increase in carbon dioxide alone will be an increase of almost 30 percent over existing carbon dioxide emissions produced in the entire state of Rhode Island. This testimony shows that if Invenergy's plan is approved, it will be virtually impossible for Rhode Island to comply with the Resilient Rhode Island Act and the Paris Agreement on Global Warming. Invenergy claims that these toxic air emissions are safe to breathe as long as the concentrations are less than the EPA maximum. However, is there really a safe level of toxic emissions that the families of Barville should be forced to breathe? The town believes that the pollution maximum set by the government cannot be conclusively relied upon by this board to de definitively determine whether breathing these toxic emissions is safe for the next 40 years. The government has limited scientific information related to the effects of any particular toxic information at any given time. As science advances, so too does the available knowledge about harmful effects. This is exactly why EPA requires that its air pollution rules be reviewed every five years. A number of substances originally considered safe by the federal government were later found to cause significant harm. Let's look at one classic example, lead paint. For many years, chemists employed by the federal government consistently recommended the use of lead paint. Eventually, the health effects of lead were discovered and laws banning the use of lead paint were passed. We now know the harmful effects of chronic exposure to lead paint include disabilities, behavioral problems, loss of coordination, and memory loss. But government health officials initially insisted that it was not harmful for adults and children to be exposed to lead, as long as the blood levels were within federally designated safe <coughs> maximums. Over time, the safe exposure was gradually reduced with newly discovered scientific information. Now we know that there is no safe amount of lead exposure, especially for children. Similar toxicity scenarios have occurred over the years for other pollutants formerly regarded as safe, to name a few, PCBs, asbestos, DDT, chloridane, EDB, and MTBE. Moreover, most of the air modeling assessments were conducted to address human health. There are different standards for ecological toxicities and thus impact to ecological health from the admitted pollutants that was largely unaddressed in the existing models. Therefore, it is the town's belief that despite the government's claim that people and wildlife can breathe safe maximum levels of toxic air emissions, government standards are not a guarantee that such emissions will not cause unacceptable harm to humans and wildlife. It is common sense that it cannot be good for humans or wildlife to breathe carbon monoxide, particulate matter, sulfur dioxide, lead, arsenic, mercury, etc., even in low concentrations. Let's take a look at the forest land that we're dealing with. Another president of the United States once said, quote, a nation that destroys its soils destroys itself. Forests are the lungs of our land, purifying the air and giving fresh strength to our people, end quote. The carbon dioxide is absorbed by forest land at the rate of between 2,000 and 4,000 pounds per acre per year. The forest land at the correct site is cleared this benefit will be greatly diminished. The forested lands that would be impacted by this project are some of the highest quality within the entire state. 
these forested lands are part of a core natural area in DEM's Rhode Island Wildlife Action Plan. They are part of forest land conservation priorities in DEM's 2010 Rhode Island Forest Resources Assessment and Strategies. DEM's advisory opinion makes at least five important points in this regard. One, the proposed site is a parcel of high value for wildlife with a diverse number of plants and animals and many state listed species. Two, forest clearing and the resulting fragmentation of the area will negatively impact both wildlife and plants in the vicinity and will inhibit DEM's ability to enhance landscape resiliency and mitigate the loss of biodiversity. Three, fragmentation of the forest will have negative impacts on fish and wildlife. Four, the facility itself will bring stressors to wildlife in the form of added noise and light pollution and potential changes to the air and water. And five, the location of the facility adjacent to substantial state holdings of conservation land is not consistent with the conservation priorities that underlie the state's conservation plans. Let's look at wildlife. Invenergy's own biological inventory dated August 2, 2017 documented 520, 520 animal and plant species just in the area of the proposed correct facility and its related rights of way. These include 81 birds, 21 mammals, including two bat species, of which one is the hoary bat, which is a species of special concern in Connecticut, eight amphibians, three reptiles, 147 butterflies and moths, 25 dragonflies and damselflies, 48 other invertebrates, and 187 plants. In Benigy's August 2, 2017 biological report acknowledged that no less than 17 state-listed species were encountered during Invenergy's biological survey. These included species with the following designations. One state endangered species, four state threatened species, 10 species of concern, and two protected species. Some organized were or organisms were identified only down to the genus level in the taxonomic classification. Some of these genera have species that are also state listed. Therefore, additional taxonomic verification would be needed to assure that they were not, in fact, listed representatives of their respective genera. Furthermore, 47 species noted from within the areas surveyed in the Rhode Island State Wildlife Action Plan are identified as species of greatest conservation need. And lastly, regarding the Invenergy Biological Survey Report, the methods and protocols used to survey the biota have inherent limitations and constraints that preclude the identification of all the species that are currently using the site. Additional species of conservation concern are therefore expected by our expert witness, Mr. Anthony Zemmer, to occur on the site. As shown by the te testimony of Mr. Zemmer, our expert <coughs> biodiversity witness, the project would also have significant adverse impacts on wetlands at the site, including adverse impacts on two special aquatic sites. The first of the special aquatic sites, and the obligate fauna that depend on it, would be completely obliterated due to the construction of the facility. Obliterated. The other special aquatic site would be significantly degraded. Mr. Zemba also explains that both direct and indirect adverse effects to, to wildlife would occur due to habitat, habitat loss, fragmentation, and habitat degradation. DEM listed various examples of the most severe impacts that would result from construction of the proposed facility, such as forest biodiversity impacts, adverse impacts on forest interior birds, such as the black-throated blue warbler, forest loss and fragmentation, loss of upland habitat, and adverse impacts to state-listed or otherwise at-risk species outside of the wetlands. That's in the DEM advisory opinion. By Invenergy's own admission in its August 2, 2017 report, quote, clearing and construction associated with the project will result in the loss of habitat currently used by a variety of animals and plant species, end quote. 
we respectfully submit that this is unacceptable harm to the environment, especially with regard to biodiversity. Mr. Zemba also prepared a report based on his review of the biodiversity information submitted by Invenergy. Mr. Zemba's conclusion was, quote, the proposed facility would cause significant and unacceptable harm to the environment in that it would adversely impact biodiversity, including rare native Rhode Island species and additional state species of greatest conservation need, quote, as well as regional species of conservation concern. Let's look for a little bit at noise. Excess noise can adversely impact both humans and animals. The proposed power plant would use air-cooled condensers. This type of condensate cooling system, one, is prone to very high noise levels during steam turbine bypass operations when the plant shuts, up, shuts down or stops up. Two, it is usually louder than anticipated during the design phase, and three, it is quite difficult to control the noise and make it quiet. Although the Clear River Energy Center has committed to meeting the town's noise limits, and we appreciate that, based on its experience with similar plants, the town's expert noise witness, David Hessler, has said that as a practical matter, Invenergy is likely to have a difficult time meeting this commitment, especially during startup and shutdown. Any excessive noise from the Clear River Energy Center will exacerbate and compound the existing communities of dissatisfaction with the noise from the Spectra gas compressor station located immediately adjacent to the proposed facility. I'd like to address water, sewer, and public safety. RIGL 42-98-8A6 provides that Invenergy must submit to this board evidence of, quote, measures for protecting the public health and safety and the environment during the facility's operations, including plans for the handling and disposal of waste from the facility, end quote. The statutory requirement is repeated in this board's Rule 1.6b15. Moreover, Rule 1.6b11 requires energy to demonstrate that it has access to, quote, required support facilities, e.g. road, gas, electric, water, telephone, and an analysis of the availability of the facilities and or resources of the project, end quote. Let's look at waste disposal. <coughs> With regard to the handling and disposal of waste from the facility, we have been told that Invenergy's current plan is to truck the wastes off-site. We have not been told where or exactly how these wastes will be disposed of. But we do know that trucks carrying these wastes will be regularly traveling Boroughville's roads. Let's look at water supply. There's been a lot of discussion of water supply so far in this docket, and I'm sure there'll be more. But with regard to water, Invenergy's plans for water have been unreliable and ever-changing. Invenergy's attempt to get water from the Pasco Utility District failed. Its attempt to get water from Harrisville failed. Its attempt to get water from the city of Woonsocket failed. Invenergy's current plan is to gain, obtain water from the town of Johnston and truck it to the plant in tanker trucks over Barbell's roads. However, as you know, that plan has, that plan has been challenged by Barbell and the Conservation Law Foundation in Superior Court. That case has not yet been resolved. Invenergy's primary backup water supply arrangement is with the city of Fall River. However, on Monday, April 23rd, just three days ago, the Fall River City Council Committee on Health and Environmental Affairs met, and they voted to, one, condemn the water deal with Invenergy, and condemn the Invenergy project in Rhode Island, and two, support a non-renewal of the deal once the deal expires in approximately 2024. These res resolutions will now go to the Fall River City Council on May 15. <coughs> Public safety. Invenergy must demonstrate that it has in place, quote, measures for protecting the public health and safety and the environment during the facility's operations, quote. However, Invenergy has not, in the opinion of the town, adequately identified the measures that they are proposing to support public health and safety. 
such as exactly how Invenergy plans to support Bonneville's police department, fire department, and other first responders, and how they will respond to potential catastrophic events. Traffic. The town's traffic engineer, Mr. Coogan, has testified that during the construction period, which is projected to last as much as three years, there will be increases in traffic with as many as 450 vehicles per hour, 450 per hour, during the afternoon peak hours. This traffic will cause adverse impacts with regard to traffic delays, especially on church and main streets. In addition, damage will be caused to the town's roads. A particular concern is the intersection of Pasco Main Street and South Main Street, which is a very sharp turn that will require large trucks to travel in opposing lanes, creating travel hazards. The traffic problems are also outlined in detail in the memorandum from Barville Sergeant, now Lieutenant, William Lacey, dated August 1, 2017, which is attached to and incorporated into the testimony of Mr. Coogan. As Lieutenant Lacey has stated, quote, large commercial vehicles will have a difficult time navigating the nearly one mile stretch of road from South Main, from the South Main and High Street intersection to the curb near Sirio's Pizza. With the small lanes of travel, almost every commercial vehicle which will pass through the area will have to violate traffic laws to navigate these intersections." End quote. Health consequences. As shown by the Department of Health advisory opinion, there is a potential for catastrophic events including toxic releases of ammonia, fires, and explosion hazards associated with compressed oxygen. Uh, I'm sorry, hydrogen. There are potential issues with spills or releases of fuel oil, storage and transportation of hazardous waste, and catastrophic events involving natural gas at the facility or in the pipeline and its related infrastructure. The Department of Health expressed, quote, grave concerns about climate change in Rhode Island as well. It identified health risks in Rhode Island from climate change, as including such matters as heat-related morbidity and mortality, increased symptoms of allergy, asthma, and other respiratory diseases, and threats to the food and fresh water supply, among others. That's in the DOH advisory opinion. In addition, the Department of Environmental Management's supplemental advisory opinion also concluded with regard to the adverse environmental effects that, quote, Mitigation might not be possible, end quote, regarding the negative wildlife impacts, and quote, the best course of action is to avoid further fragmentation to the greatest extent practical omissions, rather than to continue to fragment landscapes and look for mitigation elsewhere, end quote. Our air expert witness, Mr. Ebner, was trained and an experienced air emissions professor, professional said in his direct testimony that, quote, it is my professional opinion that the CREC facility will cause an unacceptable harm to the environment, particularly the purity of the air and the health of the citizens. The Department of Health has concluded that, quote, if Rhode Island is to meet the commitments of the Resilient Rhode Island Act, it is essential that the state begin to move from fossil fuel energy generation as soon as possible, end quote. Rejecting the license for this fossil fuel plant would not only eliminate negative environmental impacts, it would assist the state in moving away from fossil fuel energy generation as soon as possible. Third, I'd like to address public input. Anthropologist Margaret Mead once said, quote, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has." End quote. Let's look at the statutory requirement regarding public input. The Energy Facility Siting Act, specifically RIGL 42-98-9.1e, mandates that, quote, public input shall be a part of the decision-making process, end quote. Public input therefore has a specific and crucial statutory role to play in this board's eventual decision. So let's briefly, briefly review some of the public input that has been submitted during this process. First, let's look at municipal resolutions. 
32 out of the 39 cities and towns in Rhode Island have opposed this plan. In addition to the town of Boroughville, the following 31 cities and towns from all corners of the state have adopted written council resolutions formally opposing the Clear River Energy Center. Gloucester, Middletown, North Smithfield, Lincoln, South Kingstown, Richmond, Hopkinton, Tiverton, Cumberland, Charleston, Foster, Cranston, Exeter, Westerly, Jamestown, Narragansett, Little Compton, North Kingstown, Coventry, New Shoreham, West Greenwich, Pawtucket, Providence, Portsmouth, Central Falls, Warren, Bristol, Barrington, West Warren, Situate, and East Providence. Let's look at the public testimony that's been submitted to you. Public input has been loud and clear in the form of a mass outpouring of thoughtful, committed, and informed opposition to this plan that this board has seen and heard at the public hearings it has conducted in this matter. Hundreds of verbal and written submissions have been made to this board. People and organizations from all walks of life and all parts of the state have made impassioned statements in strong opposition to this plan. Let's look at some of the specific public input you have received. The Rhode Island Attorney General has taken a forceful position against the plan. His recent statement to you says in part, quote, I oppose the proposed fracked gas and diesel oil 900 megawatt power plant estimated cost 700 million to $1 billion in Barbara Rhode omissions. Climate change. The proposed energy power plant would totally undermine Rhode Island's ability to achieve greenhouse gas reductions set forth in the 2014 Resilient Rhode Island Act. Omissions. The state should not allow the building of another fossil fuel plant. Instead, we should be focused on using solar and wind to generate electricity and decreasing our reliance on fossil fuels. Omissions. There are changed circumstances that establish the power plant is not needed. The surge in renewable power is the reason. Omissions. The PUC's past finding of need is now superseded by reality. It has been overtaken by events. Based on revised data, the plan is not needed." End quote. Let's look at some environmental groups that have spoken to you. Virtually every environmental group in the state is strongly opposed to the proposed plan. The Environment Council of Rhode Island. The Environment Council of Rhode Island is a coalition of over 60 small, medium, and large environmental groups in this state. The Environment Council of Rhode Island's official position on this plan is as follows, quote, climate change is the most urgent problem facing Rhode Island and, indeed, the world. One of the major causes of climate change is the burning of fossil fuels like coal, oil, and natural gas to make energy. In this context, the Environment Council of Rhode Island, ECRI, strongly opposes the proposal to build a new long-lived natural gas-fueled electricity generator in Barbara. ECRI supports the quickest transition to clean, renewable energy and greater energy efficiency. This is not the time to be building new fossil-fired power plants, fossil fuel-fired power plants, end quote. Save the Bay. Save the Bay's position paper was recently submitted to this board at one of its last public hearings. It is well-researched and detailed. I hope you all get a chance to read it. It states in part, quote, Save the Bay, on behalf of its members and supporters, submits that the Energy Facility Siting Board must deny the application to construct the Clear River Energy Center, CREC, because the applicant cannot meet its burden. The proposed facility will cause unacceptable harm to the environment, end quote. Let's look at Save the Bay's first reason for opposing this plan. Quote, the Department of Environmental Management's advisory opinions are clear and uncontroverted. The Clear River Energy Center does not belong in the proposed location, an interior forest of high conservation value, vital to the conservation of biodiversity. Omissions. DEM reaffirms its opinion, clarifying the negative impacts to the environment. Quote, 
substantial forest clearing and fragmentation from the project will negatively impact area sensitive wildlife and plants in the site vicinity omissions. The project proposes unacceptable environmental risks to habitats and plant and, and animal species. Omissions, but still consider, uh, con continuing with the Save the Bay quote. The harm will be severe and irreparable. Omissions. There are at least 520 animal and plant species in the study that will be negatively affected, including one state endangered species, four state threatened species, 10 species of concern, two protected species, as well as 47 species of greatest conservation need. Omissions. The site is also a probable breeding area for two state threatened birds, both of which are forest interior species. Omissions. The EM reports that, quote, this work certainly has the ability to negatively impact state conservation priorities and plants, fish and wildlife habitats, and rare species, including those identified in the Rhode Island Natural Heritage Database, end quote, omissions within the quote. As distinctly stated by DEM, the location of a facility of this size and scope, immediately adjacent to substantial acreage of state holdings of conservation land, is not consistent with the conservation priorities that formed the state conservation plan, end quote. That's Save the Bay's first reason. Save the Bay's second reason for opposing the plan is as follows. I'm quoting from Save the Bay. The Energy Facility Siting Board, not DEM, must make a finding. The permitting processes under DEM jurisdiction do not address some of the most severe impacts that would result from construction, operation, and maintenance of the facility. The EFSB has a statutory duty to find that the applicant has met its burden to show that the proposed facility will not cause unacceptable harm to the environment prior to approving the application. The environment clearly includes forest biodiversity impacts and other impacts that have come to light outside of wetlands and other permitting programs. The threats to wildlife and habitat, forest <coughs> loss and fragmentation, loss of upland habitat, and impacts to state listed or otherwise at risk species outside of wetlands set forth in DEM's opinions, supported by the testimony of Scott Collins, are essentially uncontroverted and preclude a finding that there will not be unacceptable harm to the environment section 42-98-11b3. The suggestion made through the testimony of Jason Ringler, the applicant's expert, that all environmental impacts will be addressed through the DEM permitting process is not true." End quote. Save the Bay's third reason states as follows. Quote, the proposed development which requires clear cutting over 100 acres of land in part of a large core natural area, that is intact forest greater than 500 acres, slated for protection, cannot be characterized as consistent with the state guide plan omissions. Suggesting mitigation and claiming sufficient forest area coverage will not address fragmentation omissions. As stated by DEM and confirmed by the rebuttal testimony of Scott Combs, denying the application is not only the right decision for the environment, but the only scientifically sound conclusion. The proposed power plant would cause unacceptable harm to the environment by destroying a wildlife corridor that is key to ecological flow locally and even regionally." End quote. Let's look at the Audubon Society. The Audubon Society position is brief to the point and as follows. Quote, Audubon opposes the proposed 900 megawatt power plant in Barbara, Rhode Island because it will disturb the integrity of Western Rhode Island's forested habitats and wildlife corridors, and because the plan undermines Rhode Island's ability to achieve greenhouse gas reduction goals set in the 2014 Resilient Rhode Island Act, end quote. Let's take a look at the Nature Conservancy's position. Their position is in part as follows, quote, Invenergy's proposed 900 megawatt power plant for Barbo will make it more difficult for Rhode Island to achieve its newly enacted greenhouse gas reduction targets. It has not been proven necessary to meet energy needs. And it will pose unacceptable environmental risks 
to habitats and plant and animal species. For these reasons, the Nature Conservancy opposes the development of this power plant. Omissions. Continuing with the quote. Building a power plant in this location would threaten the ecosystem and its biodiversity. The Energy Power Plant would threaten the integrity of a 12,000 acre forest area, one of the largest intact natural areas in Rhode Island. Moreover, the power plant's proposed location is within a critical corridor for wildlife movements from other forest areas." End quote. I'd like to specifically look at the town of Barwell now, my, my, my client who I'm proud to represent. John F. Pichico III is the president of the Barville Town Council. Mr. Pichico has testified that the overwhelming opinion of the residents of the town and the unanimous view of the town council itself is that the proposed power plant would cause unacceptable harm to the town, its environment, its socioeconomic fabric, and its residents. Let's look at the reasons why. First, the site is wrong. In the immediate vicinity of the proposed site are numerous state forests, recreational lands, and bodies of water. While the immediate surroundings of the proposed site are forested, there are also sensitive facilities nearby, including the Eleanor Slater Hospital Zamborano Unit, which provides long-term acute care for patients with complex medical and psychiatric needs, and the Narragansett Council's Boy Scout Reservation. In 1988, when Ocean State Power sought and received approval from this board for the 560 megawatt power plant that now stands in Barbara, the site being proposed by the Clear River Energy Center here was one of Ocean State Power's alternative sites. At that time, it was referred to as the Buck Hill Road site. During that proceeding, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission conducted a formal environmental impact review. Although the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission review found that the Buck Hill Road site was one of the three least expensive sites overall, it was ultimately rejected as the preferred site for the Ocean State Power Plant. The environmental review found that the site was adjacent to the Pulaski Wildlife Refuge, Pulaski State Park, Pulaski Memorial Forest, Buck Hill Management Area, and Zamorano Hospital. The report also noted Horrible's narrow roads with numerous curves and increased traffic that would be noticeable to local residents. The environmental report found the proposed Buck Hill Road site was inconsistent and incompatible with the recreational activities available at Pulaski State Park. For the same reasons, the proposed site is wrong for the Clear River Energy Center. The second reason is the town hired experts to review the proposal. The town had a number of expert consultants and they were all asked to provide their analysis based on a review of the application and a review of many data responses we received from the applicant. The town's expert consultants have concluded that if the proposed facility would cause unacceptable harm to the town, its environment, socioeconomic fabric, and its residents, including but not limited to the following. One, as we've discussed, huge increases in air emissions in Barbara. Two, unacceptable risks to the community from the transportation, <coughs> storage, and use of ammonia, hydrogen, diesel fuel, water, and wastes. Three, unacceptable increases in noise, especially during construction that could last as long as three years. Four, unacceptable increases in dangers associated with large truck traffic constantly navigating horrible small winding roads. Five, destruction and further fragmentation of many acres of prime forest land and wildlife habitat. Six, destruction of many acres of wetlands and their associated supporting upland buffer habitat. Seven, devaluation of homes in the immediate vicinity of the facility and especially on the transportation route and especially during construction. Eight, the potential toxic releases of, of ammonia. Nine, the potential release and fire and explosion hazards associated with the use of compressed hydrogen. 10, potential spills and releases of fuel oil and other petroleum compounds. And 11, potential releases and catastrophic events involving large amounts of natural gas used at the facility. 
Let's look at what the town's planning board has concluded. At the request of this board, the town's planning board conducted an investigatory and hearing process. The planning board held a number of public meetings at which testimony was received from experts for Invenergy as well as experts for the town. Also, extensive public input was received from Boroughville's residents who were overwhelming in their opposition to the proposed power plan. The planning board asked Invenergy if it would be willing to post a performance bond or other financial security that would provide security to the town in the event Invenergy was unable to meet the requirements of the town's noise ordinance. Invenergy refused to do so. The planning board also asked Invenergy if it would be willing to commit to redesigning and rebuilding the inadequate Church Street, High Street intersection that we've talked about to make it possible for large trucks to safely pass through the intersection without having to go in the other way. Invenergy refused to do so. The planning board advised this board that the proposed power plant would be a land use that would be incompatible in many specific ways <coughs> with Boroughville's comprehensive plan and with the Rhode Island Comprehensive Planning and Land Use Regulation Act. The town zoning board, again at the request of this board, the town zoning board also followed its usual statutory process. The zoning board voted to advise this board that the plant would not meet the requirements of borrowable zoning ordinance and that no special use permit or variance should be granted. The zoning board came to this conclusion after holding a number of public hearings, which again included testimony from expert witnesses for Invenergy, as well as the town, and extensive input from the public. The zoning board specifically found and advised this board that the proposed plan would disrupt the general characteristics of the community, would not be harmonious with the environment, and would not be for the convenience and welfare of the public, but would only serve the profit motives of Invenergy. The town's building inspector. Responding to another directive from this board to issue an advisory opinion, the town's building inspector informed this board in his advisory opinion and his supplemental advisory opinion that the proposed power plan would not be in compliance with the town's zoning board for multiple reasons that he addressed in his advisories, as well as the fact that Invenergy failed to request the correct relief from the town's zoning board. The necessary use variances identified by the building inspector that would be required to construct a power plant on this particular site would, absent the Siting Act, make it impossible to do so. The town's tax assessor. This board also asked the town's tax assessor to render an advisory opinion regarding adverse effects on property values in the town. The tax assessor concluded that one, based on a large scale study conducted specifically on the effect on property values of power plants, the negative impact on property values could be in the 3% to 7% range. And two, residential properties directly across the street from the proposed facility's entrance would experience lower marketability and potential negative impacts to their market values, especially during the construction phase. The Towns Conservation Commission. The Towns Conservation Commission is a municipally funded organization that focuses on local conservation of resources within Boroughville. The Conservation Commission conducted a thorough review of the application and filed a written submission with this board on March 31, 2016, listing many problems it found with Invenergy's application. For example, the Conservation Commission addressed the impacts that the truck, truck traffic would have. In addition to the sheer number of trucks required to constantly transport the necessary ammonia, hydrogen, diesel fuel, water, and wastes, the Conservation Commission stressed the risks of accidents on Barville's rural roadway network and is not designed to accommodate these large trailer trucks and tankers, especially in the winter. The Conservation Commission was also concerned with damage to Barville's roads for the next 20 to 40 years. Now, Invenergy asks this board to ignore all the harmful impacts that we've just discussed and instead look at the potential savings of 1 to 2 percent and approve the plan. But these small savings, even if they exist, which we dispute, are substantially outweighed by the many unacceptable environmental harms to the town, the state of Rhode Island, its residents, its wildlife, and its overall environment. Can we really put a price 
on the cost of toxic emissions in the air we breathe? Can we really put a price on the cost of increased toxic exposure to our children and grandchildren over the next 20 to 40 years or longer? Can we really put a price on the risk of trucks carrying ammonia or hydrogen polluting the air at ground level and possibly crashing as they drive through the heart of the town for the next 40 years? By law, Invenergy has the following burden of proof in this matter. One, Invenergy must prove that the proposed 1,000 megawatt plant is, quote, necessary to meet the, the needs of the state and or reason for, region for energy, quote, as demonstrated by, quote, long-term state and or regional energy need forecasts, end quote. Primarily because the independent system operator's forecast of net peak summer load is decreasing for the next 10 years. Invenergy cannot meet its burden of proving a forecasted need for the plant. Two, Invenergy must prove, quote, that the proposed facility is cost justified, can be expected to produce in energy at the lowest reasonable cost to the consumer, quote, and that it, quote, will enhance the socioeconomic fabric of the state, end quote. Primarily because the capacity supply obligation for Unit 1 alone is $13.9 million per year more expensive than capacity that was procured in FCA 12 in 2018. Invenergy cannot meet the burden of proving either lowest reasonable cost or socioeconomic enhancement. And three, Invenergy must prove that the proposed facility, quote, will not cause unacceptable harm to the environment, quote. This proposed facility will emit 7.2 billion pounds of climate changing carbon dioxide per year. It will emit hundreds of thousands of pounds of other toxic emissions per year that can cause cancer, respiratory disease and distress, and other health problems. It will destroy wetlands and will fragment a vital forest. It will harm animals and plants in the area, including many species that have threatened and protected status. Accordingly, Invenergy cannot meet its burden of proving that the plant will not cause unacceptable harm to the environment. For all of these reasons, the town respectfully submits that the evidence in this matter will demonstrate that the board should not, indeed that legally it cannot, license this plan. Thank you. Yay.